Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's been a great pleasure to welcome today's program, Gary Knights, who's Senior Director of Product Management at Alemica. And today we're going to talk about integrating customer portals. Now, there are many ways that companies, you know, exchange data and information with their trading partners, including using, you know, customer portals. And while using, you know, online customer portals were meant to, uh, you know, move away from, you know, using faxes and emails, um, portals themselves have, you know, created some integration challenges. Uh, so what are some of these challenges? How are digital networks helping to uh, overcome these challenges and helping companies to integrate uh, online portals into the end-to-end -end processes? And, uh, you know, what is, uh, uh, you know, what are some of the benefits companies can experience as a result of this? Well, those are the main questions we're going to address in today's episode, and it's great to have Gary with us on the program to share his insights and perspective on the, on the topic. So, Gary, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. It's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to uh, having a good dialogue with you. Great. Well, Gary, you know, we, we've had uh, uh, several of your colleagues there at Alemica on, on Talking Logistics before. Uh, this is the first time for you. Uh, like I always, I always do when I bring on a new guest, I'm always curious how they got involved in this industry. Uh, so, you know, before we dive into this whole topic of, of portals and integrating portals, um, why don't you briefly tell us a little bit about your career path? You know, why, how and why did you get involved in supply chain logistics and what your current role and responsibilities are there at Alemica? Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, first, when I got started in this, I didn't even know what supply chain and logistics were called. I knew nothing about it. Um, but I got my start in this in the military uh, as a Marine Corps officer. And I started off uh, with dreams of flying FA-18s. So I went into the flight program after college and I flew three airplanes, but um, couldn't land A4 Skyhawks on carriers. So then I shifted into aviation supply. And aviation supply is like running a big distribution center. Um, we're trying to maintain readiness of Marine Corps aircraft, frontline uh, aircraft, keep a mission critical. And uh, they would be deployed different places. We would uh, have different demand. If it's in Norway, um, things crack because of the cold. If you're in the desert, rotor blades erode more quickly because of the sand. So different demand profiles based on where things were. I didn't know any of this was supply chain. We were just trying to keep airplanes running. And then in um, uh, 1990 with the first Iraq war, I was then assigned as a logistics officer. It was a wartime role uh, for this type of unit. And I'd never been a logistics officer before, um, but uh, I had to jump into it. And basically we moved a whole warehouse, aviation maintenance facility, even a data center from North Carolina over to the um, uh, Southwest Asia. And that was my introduction to intermodal logistics because we move things via airplanes. You know, we had 10 uh, C-141s. We had two ships. We had to get stuff there by truck and by rail. And so at the time, I didn't really think anything of it. But now I look back and that, you know, those type of experiences really, really informed because there was a lot there um, that, you know, I was just kind of thrown into. And then after I got out of the service, um, I got my master's degree while I was in got out of the service, worked in consulting for about 10 years. About half of that time was operational um, in uh, oil refineries and chemical plants. And then the second half of that uh, 10 years was um, in SAP implementations. And what our company did was, uh, our motto was, we bring people and technology together. So all about high technology rollouts. Then I joined Alemica when it first started and I worked in implementation, implemented all of our products. And I've been a product manager for the last, um, uh, 10 years or so. And so um, my role in product management is on the order to cash side. Um, everything related to consuming inbound orders, um, automated customer service. But I've also, um, uh, for a while, temporarily took over logistics, and I've also uh, managed our procurement offering. So pretty much know everything about, about the whole company, but with a real focus on the order to cash. Well, fa fascinating background. I mean, you're, you're actually the, the second guest I've had on recently that, that ha has had a, a background in, in the military and in, in the Marines. And certainly, you know, uh, I can't think of a better uh, environment, if you will, to learn about or get dropped into the world of supply chain logistics and then the military because there's you know, just a level of complexity involved. And, um, you know, certainly a lot of the leaders in the industry today have come from, from that background because it does... Uh, you know, prepare you very well for uh, the, the battleground of the <laughs> business world and, and everything happening in the uh, in chemicals and process industries, retail, consumer goods, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, you can almost think of that as, you know, the, the complexities there are different, but 
nonetheless, you know, uh, I think what you learn in the military, you know, translates very well to, uh, you know, the business environment here. And then obviously, you know, great, great background there on, on the technology side. Uh, so so let's, let's get into the topic now. I mean, mm -hmm. I think when a lot of people think about, uh, you know, trading partner connectivity, you know, they tend to think about EDI. I mean, that's the first thing that comes yep. to mind for, for a lot of folks. But, but many companies, the reality is that they, they also use a lot of online portals, you know, to access orders, submit invoices, and, and conduct, you know, other, other transactions. And we, and we saw the rise of portals really, you know, during the dot-com era when the internet and the web really started making inroads into the, into the business world. I mean, so, so how widespread is, you know, the use of customer portals in the process industry and, and what's the main reason companies use them? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And there, there, um, when I think about portals, I actually think of three types of portals. Um, one would be supplier portals. Another would be a logistics portal. And a third would be a customer portal. And the supplier and logistics portals are basically used by procurement type organizations to either get um, materials or uh, logistics assets uh, procured for their organization. And so in, in, in that um, realm, it's the owner of the portal, the procure, procuring organization. They have the money. They kind of control things. And they can try to drive their suppliers to the portal. Um, now, suppliers don't necessarily like that because they have to do double entry. But you see, you see um, many companies want to use portals. And one of the reasons they want to use them is that procurement organization gets a lot of benefit because if their suppliers do use it, um, it's relatively low cost for the procurement organization. They're shifting some costs, but, um, but they're automated on their side. Then I'd contrast that with a customer portal, and uh, that's where you have the customer service organization wants to have a portal uh, so that their uh, smaller customers, maybe smaller order volume, has a place that they can place an order, kind of like Amazon. You go out there, pick your product, it gets delivered. Um, we see limited uptake in that because no one likes to go to a portal and do double entry. Now, one place where I do see people will go to a portal is for visibility. Uh, people don't mind logging into a third-party portal to, to see the status of their order or to get uh, a certificate of analysis or shipping papers. They will go to a portal for that. Yeah, that's, great. that's a great distinction in terms of, you're right, there is you know, a, a lot of different types of you know, portals out there. And a lot of times, like you mentioned, you know, the, the portals was viewed as a, as a way to interface with some of the smaller trading partners out there, right? So yep. where EDI didn't make sense or where EDI was too costly or prohibitive is to put up this portal, whether it's a supplier portal, customer portal, or a logistics portal, you know, as the main way, uh, as the main way to kind of interface there. Uh, but just like with EDI, uh, you know, portals come with their own, you know, integration, you know, challenges, especially if companies have to access, you know, multiple portals, right? I yep. mean, I mean, what are some of the, the challenges, you know, that companies experience with, you know, working with portals? Yep. Well, th think of a customer service representative um, who is being asked to go to, um, you know, five or 10 uh, supplier portals every day to go look for orders. So the first thing is they have to keep track of these five or 10 passwords. Um, the portals themselves might change over time. And the customer service, like they're busy. They want to be out there helping customers, um, you know, uh, consume their contracted volumes, arrange transportation, things like that. But then they have this thing uh, hanging over their head like, oh, God, I got to go to those five or ten portals. What if they forget? What if they, you know, miss an order? Um, and then from the perspective of a customer service manager, if they have to uh, bring a new person in, uh, like when someone goes on sick leave or maternity or holiday or something, they have to make sure that person has all those logins and can go to those portals. They have to re-register them. There, there's a lot, a lot of moving parts there. And then there's the other um, aspect of translating the customer data values into your data values. So all this knowledge is inside the head of the customer service rep. They have to remember it. They have to remember not to make a mistake. And then the customer service manager has to figure out how do I back that person up? You know, I, I see a similar type of challenge, you know, in the transportation world, for example. Yep. Let's say you're a, a, a carrier or, or owner operator, and now you've got such a you know, proliferation of, of portals out there, you yep. know, whether it's load boards or some of these new play. So, you know, if you're, if you're a carrier, if you're a driver, you know, now you have to go and access, you know, 100 different boards or 100 different apps, you know, to try to see what loads might be available to you. And you know that that just creates a lot of inefficiency and 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 and, and you know eats up a lot of time. Yes. Um, where you know it kind of makes it very difficult to kind of consolidate all of that and 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 be able to have a more holistic view of what's what's happening, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yep.
So, you know, connecting and extracting data and information from, from multiple customer portals is, is, you know, I view it as analogous to connecting and exchanging data with, with and information with multiple trading partners, yep. you know, which is a core value proposition of digital networks or what I like to call supply chain operating network. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how are digital networks helping companies integrate customer portals into their end-to-end -end processes and, and what are some of the capabilities required? Yep. Now, that's a great question. Like we, we've been integrating with uh, customer portals for many, many years or supplier portals for, for many years. Um, and one of the benefits of having a network do it is when we integrate that portal, we try to build one connection, one very strong connection with that supplier portal to receive orders or send invoices, uh, COAs, whatever it is. And then um, on the Alemica side of the network, then be able to switch that information and use the existing integration path into the ERP so that there's really no work needed by the uh, supplier. They're all, if they're already connected to Alemica, they can use that portal connection. It's really just configuring, okay, now instead of manually going to that portal to get the orders, um, they're going to automatically flow into the ERP system. So we take it from being a development project to um, a configuration and test type of project. And if you think about it from a, there's like a natural, um, monopoly is not the right word, but there's like a natural positioning for a network to do this. Because if you have a thousand companies, that each have to go and develop a custom connection into any portal. That work is done a thousand times versus if, if a network does it once, you know, there, there's a huge cost savings there to do that to the overall industry um, to, to do that through a network. Yeah, no, I view this. I mean, I've, I've been a long time proponent uh, of network based, you know, business models and, and networks I mean, for the yeah. reasons you just talked about, you just talked about is, um, you know, you get this network effect yeah. you know, ability, right? So, you know, you've got companies historically, you know, recreating the wheel over and over and over again. Yes. Um, whereas I, you know, I view it, you know, the, the ability to connect once into a network and being able to have, um, you know, access to that data and information, for, you know, across your trading partner network. It's just a much more scalable, you know, approach to, you know, to manage it, especially because the, the trading partner network is always, you know, is always changing. And, and there may be already other parties in that network that you may not be working with today that you may want to work with tomorrow, but already, you know, a lot of that integration work has already been done because they're already part, you know, part of that network. Now, yeah. one of the things you mentioned before was, you know, uh, kind of just the, the, the data differences, you, you know, the way people call, you know, I may call something X and somebody, you know, a supplier may call it Y. Um, that's got to be part of how this works too, right? In terms of doing that kind of data translation. Yes. No, that, that's a very important part of it. And that's another challenge that we've been uh, working through and have experienced for the last, you know, 18 years of Alemica. You'll have, uh, we've seen some really crazy things where the same part number means uh, different units of measure at different locations or customer service knows that if someone is ordering it um, and it's above 5,000 pounds, send it in a tote. If it's less than 5,000 pounds, send it in a drum. These are things that are all memory resident and are, and are handled uh, manually. So when you do these network interconnects to a portal, a part of that then is going to be to put in those uh, data, tr uh, data translation elements. And so we've looked at this problem, did a lot, have done a lot of market research on it. Uh, we're rolling out some solutions um, as we speak. We just announced them. Uh, to solve it. But, you know, you want to be able to do things like take a, a bulk measure and turn it into a package measure based on all these different conditions, have that be easily maintainable, scalable, um, have tolerances in there, like we round up at 20% over or 50% over, because every company has different business rules, whether this quantity is going to be 12 drums or 13 drums. Everyone wants to do it differently. And our approach to that is to make it very scalable and configurable. Right. I mean, I think one of the, you know, uh, you know, Nirvana would be if there was actually true standards out there in the industry. We've seen, that, we've seen this with EDI, right? I mean, we talk about EDI standards, but there is no such thing as an EDI standard because no. every company, you know, kind of tweaks it and, and adds fields and reori you know, reorients the, uh, the, 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 the components and, all, and so forth. So it's a kind of a Tower of Babel, uh, you know, environment yes. to have there. And so, you know, networks have had to deal with that uh, uh, you know, challenge. And, and it sounds like it's the same thing here with kind of the, the, uh, the, the portals, right? You know, that's oh, the same, same exact of, thing. Yeah. Same exact thing ha happens here. So you have to have the, 
from a technology standpoint and from a data management standpoint, uh, you've, you've got to have the capabilities to, to do those translations. No, you really do. And, and that, that applies uh, even for an EDI connection. Like you said, one standard gets used by different ways. And I always kind of smile when someone says, we're going to roll out a new data standard. There's all these organizations that are rolling out a new data standard. And first, even if everyone made a business agreement to adopt it at the CEO and board level, think about the challenge of rolling that out to the organizations. And then someone's going to make a, a mistake and accidentally tweak it. And so you're going to have differences there. And so every new standard for data and every new standard for product nomenclatures and part numbers actually adds an additional degree of freedom to the problem and makes it more complex. Um, we, Alemica, when it started, thought, hey, we'll get everyone onto the same data standard and that'll make things easier. It, it, it simply didn't work. And so we actually, when we re-architected our next generation network, we had, took the philosophy that the world is going to be dynamic and variable. And that's our design point. You know, we're not going to try to drive standards. We'll support them, but the world is actually very variable. And that's really what we want to be is that, that uh, 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 interpreter of the Tower of Babel. You know, we, we want to take that Babel in and send good machine readable uh, information out. Right, right. Yeah, right. I, think, I think that's been the, uh, the, the drive across the industry is kind of that recognition. And yep. really then the focus is becoming, you know, how can we create a, a, a technology platform or an architecture that's flexible and dynamic enough to deal with all yep. these different permutations and, and, uh, and, and the fact that we don't know what's going to come down the road tomorrow. Exactly. So technology needs to be able to, you know, handle that. Uh, so, you know, can you share a little bit about, you know, some of the benefits, you know, companies are, are experiencing by, by using this network-based approach to, to portal connectivity? Yeah, um, especially like on the customer service side, where they're being asked to go to these supplier portals, um, that adds a lot of stress and um, just uh, training overhead. So customer service actually likes it better when they don't have to go to those portals. Um, job satisfaction goes up. Uh, the, the need for training goes down. It makes it easier to, to train people. Um, they also see a reduction in um, errors, like, uh, you know, 8 to 10% reduction in errors from just, you know, uh, keystrokes. Um, you see, you get better visibility because um, now the data is being translated and it's more normalized. And so you have uh, better visibility, better, better reporting. Um, also lower working capital because anytime you're dealing with these um, problem like things, the way people address, the way corporations address it is, okay, let's carry a little more inventory to cover that, you know, all these what if type scenarios. So as you uh, streamline these types of operations, you end up uh, allowing a reduction in working capital without a reduction in service level. No, great, great benefits there. And, and I think, you know, I, I think even at its most basic, what you mentioned early on, is uh, just eliminating waste from the process. Yeah. Right? And there's a lot of, of time and labor wasted just with this manual entry uh, of information, which again, creates the potential for errors, which then has that ripple effect that can impact inventory, yes. can impact customer satisfaction and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so just, a, 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 you know, from a basic standpoint, if, if you're looking around and you're seeing a lot of people, you know, rekeying in information and going from one, you know, screen to another and then right, typing things, you know, that's a, an opportunity for improvement there. Yeah, it's definitely a signal that you ought to do something. People are logging into screens other than your own SAP system. That should be a, a trigger that something isn't quite right. Or another one would be like if your trading partners are asking you to log into a portal. That might cause you to say, hey, why don't we go ahead and do a direct data integration? Because then, then you can get the system-to-system -system communication going that's much more powerful. Right. Well, I mean, I, I guess that, that kind of leads me to my last question. Maybe we, we already answered you know, part of it here. You know, as, a, as a way to wrap up, I mean, what, what questions should companies ask themselves to assess whether you know, they're a leader or a laggard when it comes to you know, portal co connectivity? And, and what's, you know, what steps can they take to move up that maturity curve? Yep. And I would even, I would even expand it a little bit um, to say uh, not just portal connectivity, but how, what percentage of your orders and customers are automated, uh, touchless versus not. Um, because you, even when you look at portals, that's one way of doing it manually. Um, are you processing emails manually? Are, are you getting faxes manually? So phone orders. So I think looking at it holistically and portals will be a big, big component of that. But if I was going to, um, if I was an executive benchmark in my organization, I'd say what percentage of my spend orders, uh, customers are not automated. 
and then I do a Pareto analysis and use that to try to drive um, out those ones or drive drive the biggest ones into automation and then figure out, okay, what are tools and techniques out there to more fully automate the smaller ones and get as much system to system error free communication um, as possible. Yeah, that's, that's a great point and, and great recommendation there. I mean, I view this as part of the overall digital transformation yep. uh, journey that, you know, we, we've been talking about so much, you know, over the past, you know, couple of years and, and really it begins about the kind of eliminating waste. You know, to me, when yes. I think about digital transformation, one of the first steps is eliminating waste. And it's really going mm -hmm. back to, to what you just said, is doing that analysis and say, hey, where are we manually processing orders, whether it's phone, email, you know, faxes, portals and so forth. And, 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 and that's where you know, there's a lot of waste in that process and time and labor and, and, and there's costs obviously associated you know, with all of that. And that creates friction in terms of your yes. ability to be able to quickly respond to uh, any changes that might be happening in your, in your supply chain. So I think starting there is, a great, uh, is, is some great advice. Yep, and you can also see other ones, uh, sort of expanding it ever so slightly. But w one thing we see is, um, this is just one example, but where there could be like an internal disconnect inside the ERP that can be solved through digital transformation. Like what one is getting the freight cost um, onto the sales order. So even if you automate the sales side of it and you get the, the sales order to the purchase order flow into the, into the order processing system, become a sales order, you fulfill it. But if your logistics processes are manual, you still might have these other manual processes to complete the sales order and get all the costs associated to it on there correctly. So you get invoiced correctly. So um, you want to look, I think the other recommendation is think about it holistically and you might be doing things to do to digitally transform in one part of the organization. It might drive benefit over to another part. So when you take that siloed view and, and someone says, well, what's in it for my little business unit? If I automate, it might be, nothing. It might actually benefit another part of the organization. So you want to have someone uh, who's taking that broad, uh, non-siloed perspective of driving uh, process improvement, continuous improvement to really drive better customer service in the end. No, that's, that's a great, great advice. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, when, um, whenever I hear that recommendation, I always think about that old um, uh, Harvard Business Review uh, article uh, you know, about purchase, uh, about stapling yourself to a purchase order, <laughs> uh, which is still relevant, you know, today. But it, the, the point was, you know, truly understand the whole end-to-end -end process and see all the touch points yep. that, that, that are involved in, you know, from the time an order comes through to the time it's, you know, completely fulfilled and invoice and, and, and so forth. And, and, and that way you've got a, you know, very, you know, integrated holistic perspective of what's going on. And you can then be are better able to see where the opportunities are or where the challenges are and help you focus on those areas uh, yes. accordingly. So, you know, great, great advice there. Well, Gary, we, you know, we're, we're, we're short on time here. Uh, you know, we, like I always say at the end of all our episodes, you know, we always just manage to scratch the surface on these topics, but I think you provided some great insight and advice on, on this topic. So I appreciate you making the time to be with us today. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. It's been great. I really enjoyed it. I want to thank those of you that joined us. Uh, if you're watching this episode on demand, either at the Alemica website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question or a comment for uh, Gary, uh, you can post it there, and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to respond to that medium. Again, thank you for joining us, and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.